Hello people and welcome to the People Building Podcast. Today I am sharing with you one of my all-time favourite interviews ever. This is with a lady called Trudy Hindmarsh. Trudy used to be a secondary school teacher, a primary school teacher. She ran one of the largest stagecoach franchises, which is a children's theatre, song and dance franchise in the country. She uh, has invented a methodology for helping children to improve their confidence and she's just a really great conversationalist and you are going to love this one. Now, I have to make a confession. Uh, we recorded this interview on Zoom and Zoom did not record the video, only the audio. And I even ended up speaking to Zoom customer services about where on the cloud I might be able to find it but it just didn't record. So you're going to see a picture of Trudy's beautiful face alongside my face. Not quite so beautiful, sadly. Um, side by side, if you are watching on YouTube, but for all of the rest of you who are listening to this as a podcast, it makes zero difference that you cannot see us on screen. This is a really good listen. Let me tell you what you've got coming up. Um, so I've said... Uh, this is like having a chat with, if any of you are fortunate enough to have a wise relative who is a good conversationalist, this is what the conversation with Trudy is like. You're going to feel like you're just listening in to a chat between us and you're going to hear a lot about the make a difference streak that literally runs through this woman's bones in every fibre of her being, she is a make a difference person. She's also an excellent example of how um, NLP is integrated into daily life and how she's been using it for decades without really realising what she was doing um, and that she was using NLP in the first place. Um, she is an excellent lesson in sticking at it when the going gets tough because Trudy's going to tell you about some tough circumstances that she's been through in her life and how she's been through it and got through the other side. So I'm going to say that this podcast is going to be of particular interest to anyone who is transitioning, maybe from one job to another job or considering a transition. If you are a parent or a professional working in education, I think you're going to find this one particularly interesting. Um, she gives us some insight into what the mental health arena was like a few decades back and how much that has changed, you know, how much more support there really is these days now. Uh, but most of all, she is an amazing storyteller. So I think you're going to really enjoy listening to this one. Now, there are going to be some trigger warnings here. Uh, Trudy describes an incident of um, a friend who went through a period of psychosis. There is mention of overdose. There is mention of suicide. Um, so all of those things crop up along the way throughout the podcast. Uh, but overall, I think you're going to find that this is a podcast with an awful lot of insight into what it is to go through life and take risks, well-informed, educated risks and how worthwhile that can be at times. So for now, I shall hand over to Gemma from the past and Trudy Hindmarsh in talking about her experiences throughout life and her career and all of the amazing experiences that she's had of inspiring and influencing so many young people. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. How are you? Good. We've got a bit of sunshine here. I don't know about where you are. It's cloudy, but I can see blue bits. <laughs> all right. Well, maybe ours is coming your way. So hello, everybody. Uh, today I'm joined by the fabulous Trudy Hindmarsh. Um, as a student, 
Trudy trained as a Samaritan. So she had helping people in trouble as a fundamental desire from a very early age. She started her teaching career after being trained in primary education, however, ended up starting her career teaching secondary and then sixth form uh, teaching English. Further appointments took her through all ages of secondary teaching and um, eventually back to primary education and then finally to infant teaching. Eventually her final appointment she was promoted to the senior management team of a large primary school in Cleveland and worked as a Senko there for over 10 years. At that time she devised set up and operated a system of individually teaching all the children from uh, six years up to 11 years in the school who were experiencing significant reading difficulties leading to the development of something called the magical change system. Across 20 years, Trudy was the founder and principal of several very successful performing arts schools, which she opened in the northeast of England in 1997. She won six awards from different awarding bodies at local, regional and national level for her work within these schools. And she truly believes that confidence or lack of it is the keystone to everything a child can achieve in their life. After surprisingly positive results from her early magical change conversations with young people, Trudy went on to a 10 year mission alongside her working life to develop methods and research which might be successful. During this period, she trained as an NLP practitioner with NLP for Kids and linked the psychology department of Teesside University and an educational psychologist and research psychologist to further her studies. She has pursued a private interest in neuroscience and in autism in recent years and so far around 150 children and young people have benefited from the emotional support that magical change brings and Trudy will soon be embarking upon training others to deliver magical change techniques. Welcome Trudy! Thank you. <laughs> you. Want a drink? <laughs> yeah, I think I need one now. <laughs> All right. So um, I feel like there's a lot of different rabbit holes for us to go down here. Let me rewind. We'll go right back to the beginning. I didn't know that you trained as a Samaritan. So how old were you back then? When when did that happen? Uh, I'd be about 19, I think. Okie dokie. Wow, that's quite an experience I would think for a 19 year old to go into funnily enough I was just speaking to someone the other day who is a volunteer for the Samaritans and it sounds like as an organization they're really good at supporting the volunteers that work for them um what was it like for you um it was interesting because in those days you had groups according to which day you volunteered for okay um, and they they did they did support you because you had regular meetings where you came together and discussed problems that you'd had. Yeah. Um, of course, in those days there was no technology, so mm -hmm. anything you could offer anybody apart from your phone, yeah. um, uh, anything you could offer anybody was in leaflet form. So wow. it kind of brought pe people had to come into the centre. Okay. Um, I don't know whether they do that so much anymore. So I haven't had any contact with Samaritans for a lot of years. Yeah. Um, but it was very, very interesting. And I had quite a lot of interesting and funny experiences doing it. <laughs> yeah. The lady that I was speaking to the other day, she said that there are some people where you really do feel like the problem is genuine and that you're making a difference. And then there are some quite perverse calls that come in. Um, and she said that there's also um, almost like quite a core cluster of people who are sort of known from an attention seeking perspective and, and almost kind of call up with completely fabricated stories that they tell. Did you have stuff like that going on as well? Well, I think times were different then, in all honesty, yeah. Gemma. I think all of this attention-seeking stuff has been fed by social media and online this, that and the other. Um, I, we were never trained to think that people were coming to us with anything other than a genuine yeah. reason. And one of the key things was that you can't put the phone down. 
Right. So even if you have, and we did have the what colour are your knickers brigade ringing. Um, <laughs> but you just had to persuade them that it was, you know, they were stopping other people from being helped and would they kindly get off the line kind of right. thing. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So I never felt that. Um, and I had a funny experience one night because I was... I, I slept, I did nights as well. So you actually slept on a camp bed in those days. Wow. And uh, you were always with, in a pair. And the other lady who was there, I was. we were talking about these, what colour are your knickers calls and time wasters and all of this. Yeah. Um, and we were exchanging stories about how, um, how had people dealt with it, basically. Yeah. And she just told me that um, a friend of hers had a police whistle next to the phone and as soon as she got a call she didn't like the sound of she would just blast it down <laughs> and I was still laughing about yeah. that and the, the phone went and well. I suppose I must have had some laughter still in my voice I wasn't consciously laughing but I must have sounded upbeat I don't know and um, this lady came on the line and I said trotted out you know this is Samaritans how can I help you and she said I don't think you can. So I said, oh, well, do you want to tell me about it? And then we'll see. She said, no. She said, it's just nice to hear somebody laugh. Yeah. And she rung off. Aww. And so, yeah, sort of things like that last yeah. with you and you go, wow. Another time um, I had a boy who was on a motorbike who um He'd stopped at a, so he was speaking to me from a, a telephone box and he was on quite a long time. So he'd had some big row with his girlfriend and he was threatening to drive into a, a brick wall on his bike, which was pretty. Um, yeah. Oh my good God, you know, yeah. how, how, what's the responsibility like? So I talked to him for quite a long time and then I, did, I, I was desperate for the loo. And I thought, what am I going to do? I can't, I'm, I'm wriggling. <laughs> and then at the end I thought honesty is the best policy so I said listen I said I'm perfectly prepared to to continue talking to you but I'm desperate for a wee can I, can I go and come back again <laughs> and he started laughing and he said yeah I need one as well I'll have to go outside <laughs> so we both went to the loo came back and and again it was that break in the state yes which you know NLP talks about and I suppose yes. both of those show the moods shifted yeah. and the you know and and he said I'm fine I'm going yeah. home now so wow. the power of laughing yeah or, you know being vulnerable really I suppose admitting you need to win. yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's so interesting so do you is it looking back that you can see that that was maybe a fundamental building block to your making a difference type of career or like did you did you already know back then what sort of a route you were going to end up going down in life no 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 I thought I would end up um I, th I thought it would be straightforward I would train as a primary teacher. Famous in our so yeah, I thought it would be straight. Primary teacher <laughs> for all of my working career and retire. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I thought was going to happen. <laughs> wow. So, so when did you, uh, were you at college or university training whilst you were doing the Samaritans stuff? I was at university when I was doing the Samaritans. And then yeah. I also... Um, there was a like a, a club you know how you go and you you go to rag week and there's all these societies yeah. and things you can join so I joined one that was about helping people in the community okay. with more practical things yeah. so it was yeah. a lot of the time it was decorating well yeah. we we didn't have decorating skills and <laughs> you know the, the teenagers that or the students didn't know much about it but quite a lot of people volunteered yeah and shortly after I started it, the guy who ran it wanted to leave it. And right. then there was a chance then that it would grind to a halt and wouldn't continue. So I said I would I would run it. Yeah. Um, so that was really interesting. So I had to go and visit um, houses that were in a real bad states in Sheffield and kind of see what 
we might be able to do with it with a lick of paint and you know it was very much winging it yeah Um, yeah but again you see with hindsight I think it wasn't so much the uh the decoration of the house that made a difference to the family or the person it was the fact that they had young people coming in and they were having a laugh with them and you know it was another side of life and yeah and for the students concerned, I think it was a real good eye opener. You know, yeah. we were all privileged and there, yeah, having the chance to pursue what you wanted to do with your life. And here were people who had fallen through the net, really. Yeah, what an amazing project. So, were you from a family of people who were the helping sorts? Yes, my yeah. mum was for, yeah. for certain. Yeah. Yeah. you had a problem she'd solve it for you or she'd try <laughs> yeah <laughs> um were were there teachers in your family is that what led you down the teaching road no um I was the first member of our wider family to ever go to university so okay. um everybody had been in in manual jobs um yeah. you know low-paid jobs in many instances my, my dad was um a joiner so he, he was like fully qualified He'd okay apprenticeship and everything but uh no really it was it was a launch pad so other two other cousins had gone to university mm-hmm. uh, sorry had gone to um grammar school right. but beyond that nobody had ever gone to grammar school either so it okay. was like a, a really big thing within the family I felt like uh well, I felt proud, but I also felt like I carried a lot of people's expectations yeah. as well. It's almost a bit of responsibility to, you know, make sure that you do it and you do well at it. So yeah. did it did it go that way? Was it was uni plane sailing? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on every level, when I arrived there, I liked it. So there, mm-hmm. there was nothing to dislike um but I felt like a fish out of water so uh, I had a a a strong Manchester accent I've got probably most of that still there along with other clippings I've picked up on the way um but most of the people that were living in my hall of residence had come from private schools okay and it was like you know when you would talk to them their life experience was just so totally different to mine Mm -hmm. and it wasn't the felt that mine was any worse but I just didn't feel like I fitted in yeah but come out of something that I belonged in and now I'm you know I'm floundering around here and uh, I don't really belong here so for the first few weeks it felt I suppose homesick and I suppose yeah. many students feel that so yeah. you know that was true but then I had a a girl that I'd been to school with so <laughs> I wouldn't call her a friend but we weren't yeah. unfriendly but she just wasn't a particular friend uh, and she was really suffering dreadfully with you know with hindsight now was deep depression and okay. possibly bipolar wow um and because I was the only one she knew mm-hmm. I was the one that kept being called upon and I was happy to do that I was happy yeah. to try and um, make a difference for her but Mm. uh nothing much seemed to yeah um and then one dreadful day um I'd said to everybody that I knew on my landing I'm not getting up early this morning I'm going to have a lie in and there's somebody hammering on the door and I thought you can just bugger off I've told yeah. you I'm not getting up go away yeah. and this went on for a while in the end I got up and they said uh, can you come and and see so I said yeah what's the matter she said we don't know we don't know what's the matter with her okay so I get down to her room and it, she was in such a terrible state she had um like a hole in her shoulder like something had been gouged out of her shoulder Oof. teeth were broken she was totally and utterly delirious she was thrashing around on the bed and I went oh my good god what yeah. what's on it just a, a, about this time the, the tutors the staff appeared yeah and that and it was like they were asking me it was yeah. like well so what's the matter with her and I said I have no idea what's the matter yeah. with her um so I sat next to her and she's trying to tell me things and she's make she, she couldn't speak she was just making noises and she was pointing to the desk so 
So I, I went over to the desk and I opened all the drawers and there were about 10 empty bottles of tablets in the drawers. So then, of course, the ambulance comes, but it was in the middle of winter and the ambulance couldn't get any grip on the on uh, everywhere was yeah. <laughs> black ice everywhere. Um, and we took her down to the hospital. Um, they pumped her stomach. We could hear her screaming wow. throughout a and &E. It was oh. It was just horrendous. And then to end all of that, the people, the adults who were there, um, were walking home and they said, um, well, you see, the thing is, we won't be able to tell her parents because she's over 18. And it, it was like, it was like the, <laughs> it was like the Incredible Hulk. I just yeah. went, what? It was like everything came out and I just yeah. stood and I lambasted these women in the middle of the street. And she said, she said to me, well, we can't because it's um, legality, Quality. but you yeah. can, you can, you can tell her. Wow. So to, to put a long story very short, I ended up being the go between between the college and her parents. Mm -hmm. I ended up being the go between between the hospital and her parents because wow. the, the hospital doctors are saying to me, is she pregnant? And I'm going, I I don't know. Well, has she got a boyfriend? Yeah. Well, can you go and talk to him and ask him? Is she I mean, you couldn't write it really wow. as a scenario. Um, so then it was Christmas and that was my first term. Oh, <laughs> my thought, oh goodness. I think, I think really I need to be rethinking <laughs> my life here. Yeah. But of course you get home and everybody's very excited and oh, yeah. is it this and is it that? And you go, and I went back and I'm so glad right. I went back yeah because yeah. you know it, eventually you settle down and they're the best mm -hmm. years of your life but yeah uh, it did teach me to stick in when things get rough for certain. yeah do you feel that the responsibility that you took with that young lady was was the right thing to have done is there any part of you that would maybe deal with that differently now I, I don't think it would ever be asked of anybody now. I mean, no, I'm 67 not. now. I was, mm. what, 19, 20 then. Yeah. We're talking about a different era. Um, yeah. No, I'm sure it wouldn't, because with all the health and safety legislation yeah. and preventing who can sue who, I don't yeah. honestly think anybody would be put in that position now. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it was it was pretty intense. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And. I mean, she was she was fine afterwards. She recovered, but then about twelve months later, she did it. She jumped out of the window and killed herself. Oh, that's so sad. And, and nobody had, no, you know, any any idea. That was a a huge shock that day as well. Yeah. Because somebody was telling me, and he, he couldn't remember her name. Right. Um. And he said, um have you heard about the girl at Halifax who's committed suicide? I said, oh, no. And I'm thinking it's like a, a first year student. Mm. And he said, yeah, I think her name's and he's coming up with all sorts of names. And, and it's like coming out of the depths of my mind. I can, I'm going, it isn't, is it? It isn't, is it? It's not, it's not that name. Yeah. And then I said, is it? Yeah. And I said her name and he said, yeah. And I just slumped down the wall. It was just like somebody polaxed you. It was really wow. tough. Yeah, yeah, that's very hard. Did they have sort of support in place back in those days for when things like that happened? I don't really think so. She saw, I think, a psychiatrist twice after the first incident. Yeah. But it was just literally a quick appointment in and out. And yeah. There was no follow through. There was no counselling in those days. Yeah. Well, I was thinking as well, even for sort of people like yourself. So, you know, other students that had been friendly with her or been supportive towards her, you know, that. No, there was nothing. Like there that. was nothing. No. Wow. No. So you you kind of muddled on through and. Stuck at it with uni. Yeah, I got, I got through uni and then um, I was wanting to do the postgrad so that I could teach in primary. Yeah. Um, and I did that. And the <laughs> we went on two teaching practices across the training period. And the first teaching practice I was on was utterly 
horrendous. I mean, it's like scarred my life. So this woman had come from a prime, uh, sorry, from a secondary background and she was teaching primary. Okay. And she was a horrible woman. She was horrible to adults and she was um, probably doubly horrible to children. And um, so I started this teaching practice with her. And because I knew nothing about anything, everything she said to me, I thought, well, it, she must be right because she's yeah. been working as long as she has. You know, she was an older lady. And I think that the time that the time that I think I just went, oh, my good God, something's not dreadfully wrong here. It was coming up to Christmas and um, she was talking about having a play or doing a play with the kids. So she took this child who was um, ginger head and she brought him out in front of her. And she said, so when we do this play, why can't so-and-so be Joseph? So the kids were putting up their hands saying, because he's got ginger hair, because yeah. he's too small. Because I mean, I <laughs> barely got words out. And, and at first I was just so shocked, I thought, is there going to be something good at the end of this? Yeah. You know, is she going to build this child up? And, you know, no, that was it. Went back to his seat. Wow, wow, wow. So um, she would, I, I, I would do my lessons. And according to her, there was never anything good I'd done about it. So whatever it was, it was crap. So, so then I would go, all right. So I would write down all my crap dealings and mm -hmm. then I would go home and I'd stay up till God knows what time at night trying to get it right. And then I'd come back and she would never say, well done for getting those things mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But this is what you need to do now. She just yeah. ignored all of that right. and went for something else that was crap. So yeah. consequently, I just thought, well, I'm, you know, everything I've wanted to be in my life I'm obviously not cut out for so I need to get out of this now uh, I developed migraines I developed bronchitis during this time because it was just stressful yeah yeah very much so I thought right I've got to get out of it so I, I wound myself up to go into college to see my tutor to resign Right. And when I got there, knocked on his door, there was no answer and then what he wasn't there. Mm. And because I'd wound myself up that much, I just dropped on the floor. I was just mm, I'm getting emotional now. Oh. <laughs> um fortunately, <laughs> um a, a tutor from the floor above came down and he said, What on earth's the matter with you? So I told him. And he was furious. He said that woman was told she was never to have a student again no so she'd wow. been told that prior to me being there yeah um, at the school had and I was I didn't know who to be angriest with her yeah. or the college for yeah. not having warned me yes I assume the guy my tutor didn't know it I, I yeah. hope he didn't know it um and you know so if college would have said to me this is what you need to be doing. Ignore anything else she says. Yeah. I would have been fine with the word go. Not put you there. <laughs> yeah, that would have I been mean, that would have been a good option. Do you know what's so bizarre is I had an almost identical experience when I did my nursery nurse training. Right. And we used to do uh three days in college and two days on placement. And it was my first placement in the first term. And I was in a state day nursery, uh, not day nursery, uh, just a, a regular nursery. So there'd be a group that came in in the morning and did a morning session, then a different group that came in in the afternoon and did the afternoon session. And I thought it was a bizarre setup when on the first day, so I'd sort of, you know, showed up with my lunchbox and, you know, I was all sort of set to spend my lunch times with the couple of teachers that were there so there was a there was a teacher and I think the other one was I think they were two teachers but it might have been a teacher and a nursery nurse for example but I think they were two teachers anyway I discovered on the first day that on the lunch break one of them went into one room that was in the nursery and the other one went into the other room that was in the nursery and I just sort of stood there <laughs> And one of them stuck their head out and went, oh, you can you can sit at one of the children's tables there and you can eat your lunch there. So I was like, oh, 
by myself then okay so I sort of thought well that's a funny vibe like they don't want to be with each other and neither of them want to be with me either so I thought they're not very welcoming but I let that go and there was uh, a small population of uh, Indian children that attended that nursery and that school and there was a boy there and I'll say his name because it sort of lacks context if I don't. So his name was Devraj. Anyway, um, we were going to be going outside and we were helping them to do their zips and get their shoes on and all of this stuff. And she said to me, oh, um, can you help Dave put his coat on? And I'm kind of looking around and I'm thinking, oh, I've been here for a little while now and I'm not too sure who Dave is. So I said, sorry, who? who? And she went, Dave. And I went, I don't know who Dave is. And she said, that little boy over there. And I said, oh, Dev Raj. And she said, we're in England. And whilst he's in England, he will have an English name. So at this nursery, we call him Dave. Oh, good God. And I was just flabbergasted. And I had, again, almost exactly the same experience as you. I went back into college and this you know that was one incident there were there was more uh, but I went back into college and I went up to see my tutor and I sat down and I said um I don't think that I should be on this course and I don't think that this is going to take me in the direction I wanted it to take me in and she was very confused and you know sort of saying I don't you know you're one of the best students what's going on and I explained what had happened and they whipped me out of that placement um, within, like I did, I never went back. It was just like, that's, that's it. Um, and because it, I was so far into the academic term by that stage, they really struggled to find me another placement. And I, I ended up in a placement um, like out of town. I had to get the bus there and it was a nightmare but it you know, was a completely different experience. And it's the only reason why I ended up sticking with it and completing the course. Oh, well, that is very, very similar, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. I wonder how many god-awful teachers and- It makes you wonder, right? Um, nursery nurses and whatnot there are out there. It's, it's frightening, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, and, and I was so close, like you, I was so close to going, no, it must be me. I've I've completely misunderstood yeah. the circumstances Absolutely. here. Yeah. yeah, very bizarre. So you, from there, didn't go into primary school teaching. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I was desperate to go into primary school teaching. Um, but in, again, in those days, there was a different system. So now you apply to an individual school. But in those days, you applied to a pool, it was called. Right, OK. So a local authority would think, oh, I'm, I'm, I've got 35 vacancies this time, so I'm going yeah. to enroll 35. And then they would send you where they wanted to send you. So you didn't really have much, wow. um, you know, you were just lucky you got a job, basically, yeah. was how you looked at it. Um, so I lived in Sheffield. Um, we didn't have a car at that point. Mm -hmm. and my husband was um, still doing his training. So I had to work because yeah. otherwise yeah. we were living on a student grant, the pair of us. Yeah. Um, so I applied to the Sheffield pool and I, this was another shock. I, I didn't get even an interview to, to be accepted onto the Sheffield pool. And, and I can remember going, why? Because all of the stu all of our students had sat in a library and that we'd yeah. all been filling in application forms together. Mm. And people were going, oh, I don't know what to write in this section. I, I haven't got anything I can put in there. I'm scribbling away like yeah. video. I had so much stuff to put in that was relevant to the application. Yeah. And I thought, well, I don't mind them rejecting me if they've seen me and they don't like the look of me. Sure. But why have I not got past that? And I never found that out for about mm. 10 years. Wow. And what I discovered then was that literally the year I came out of college was one of those dips in the population that happened after the war. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know how all the population yeah. keeps building and falling. So literally, as I came out, 
nobody wanted primary teachers, but the, the growth was in secondary. But nobody told us that on the course either. You know, with yeah. hindsight, you'd think yeah. people that would, were in charge of that would know that. <laughs> I mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I found out 10 years later that um, Sheffield Pool had had so many applications that they had literally pulled application forms out of a hat mm -hmm. in order to invite people for interviews. Wow. So, uh, oh, I, I could have written a book about interviews. I, I just had the most hysterical interviews and the most traumatic interviews. <laughs> so, one time I went to... Um, I went to a school which uh, had had the writer of Kez there as a teacher. Okay. I think they were living off that reputation somehow. Oh, really? So the current head of, of English was so, so bizarre. And he said, uh, I need to speak to you all privately. Um, and because the person that I employ, I need to feel like I have some connection with. So Okay. Like, okay. So we got led into this stock cupboard. So there were no windows in this place. It was just, <laughs> we sat on chairs, knee to knee. <laughs> that, that was how wow. much space we had in it. And he talked at me for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And all the time I'm thinking, whoever's on a wavelength with you, it ain't me. <laughs> and I need to be out of here as soon as possible. <laughs> so we went for the interviews themselves and there were about eight of us and the first guy went in for his interview and when he came out he was literally white he, he couldn't string a sentence all the color had drained out of him and we all rushed to him and said oh what's the matter what's the matter? yeah and he couldn't speak so he sat down and gradually the color came back <laughs> and this happened to everybody virtually who went into this interview oh. it was like waiting for the death <laughs> so I, I, it was my turn I go in and I've never seen again it squashed rooms so there must have been 10 people around this table but all so yeah. tight that we're all sitting like this squashed up, <laughs> and I'm next to the headmistress squashed up to her <laughs> and at one point the the head of of the head of the governors had these little half glasses mm -hmm. and he looks over the top of them and he said um now then, what are your ethics in life? And I thought, shit, what are they? <laughs> so, I, so he saw my confusion. So he said, um, you know, what are your views on timekeeping? And, you know, the, and I thought, well, what, are you, what are you going to say? I believe in coming in at dinner time and not... <laughs> relevance has <laughs> so I was gibbering by this time the interview finishes um and she said you can go I stood up opened the door and went in the broom cupboard so I didn't <laughs> so I had a string of those mm. and finally uh I'd be the the last one I'd been to they were actually employing about six teachers and there were about nine of us for interview so my chances of getting one were really high. And, yeah. and I, by this time I was on my second teaching practice and the head was really supportive and he liked what I did. And he said, I don't understand why you haven't got a job and all the rest mm. of it. So I, I come back from the interview and I haven't got the job again. So right. he's getting mad by this time. So he yeah. said, look, he said, you must be doing something wrong. He mm -hmm. said, you must ring them up and ask them what you're doing wrong. <laughs> so I said, uh, because in those days you got no feedback from an interview yeah. you went and that was it you got it or you didn't um so I thought I can't do that I can't ring somebody up and ask them why I didn't get it he said you must do because mm. you're obviously doing something basically very wrong <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm gibbering on the end of the phone to, to this head teacher I said I'm really sorry but Mr so-and-so says I have to <laughs> ring you and um, so what he finally said was, he said, well, you didn't do anything wrong. He said, mm. but you just didn't convince me that you could run your school without me, uh, that I could run my school without you. Right. He said, I know from your application form that you've done all sorts of relevant things, but you never told me about them. So mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but they were on the application form. Yeah. And you knew. Yeah. <laughs> said that isn't the point. You didn't sell yourself. Right. So I said, so you wanted me to brag about those things. Mm -hmm. He said. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that taught me a huge lesson. And I've taught, I've told all my kids that, in, you yeah. know, since then. Mm. So 
the next interview I go to on paper, I shouldn't have got at all. Mm-hmm. So, so like you're saying, it was out of town buses. Yeah. So I I, I'll be, I'll be good about this. So I go down to the bus depot and I say, which bus do I need? And they tell me. So on the day I'm on that bus. The, and of course the, you didn't pay as you got on the bus in those days, a conductor mm-hmm. came to you. So the conductor comes and I tell him where I want to go. He said, oh, we're not going there. I said, you are. You are. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, no. He said, uh, the bus route transfers the depot. So he said, you're on the leg that's going in that direction. So you want to be in the other direction. Oh. Well, so I get off the bus, wait for another one. Of course, I'm late by the time yeah. we get to the other end. Step off the bus, the heavens open. And I'm absolutely drowned like a rat because I've got no umbrella either and the man who greets me is the head of English mm-hmm. and introduces him as such and it was just the look he gave me that you know one of those looks that goes up and down like <laughs> well I've failed to impress you so, <laughs> down and the woman I'm sitting next to was also a hit there for interview she tells me that she is on a mat- uh, or she had been on a maternity leave And she was applying to come back because she loved the school so much. Um, And she'd been on a promoted post, but she was applying to come back on on the menial post. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I've just been invited here to make up the numbers. I'm wasting my time and my breath here. So I thought, good. Well, this is the time that I practice bragging about what I can do. Yeah, yeah. Into the interview I go and, oh, my God, what I couldn't do. Um, (laughs) standing on my head but all the time I'm talking I'm I'm going this isn't me so we get to the end and the guy says um so have you got anything you'd like to ask or anything you'd like to add so I said yes I do I said I've been told previously that I haven't sold myself enough in interview Mm -hmm. and if today I've overcompensated I'd like to apologize and they just started to laugh Right, and I've told kids to use that as a yeah as a, a get out <laughs> at the end, so that they don't come across as being big headed. Yeah, but I also tell them that what that incident showed me more than anything is that you have no idea what's going on in mm. an interview. So I thought that the head of English made a bad impression, or I'd made a bad impression on him. He was the retiring head of English. The right. head, new head of English was in the interview. Uh, um, the new that the head teacher was brand new right. but neither of them wanted people from the past yeah. to come in so the woman who was next to me actually had no chance of coming in because they there wanted a new room yeah so I always say to kids you know don't be put off because you've just got no idea what's going on in the background and yeah. it just might be your day yeah absolutely do you think teaching attracts a certain type of person um maybe um to start off with so if people decide they want to be a teacher yeah from the first um maybe but actually these days there's people from all sorts of backgrounds it's quite a mixed bag yeah Yeah. and they don't stay as long either so (laughs) and i'm not surprised no um so yeah I think whereas it it always used to be looked upon as as like a vocation, like Mm -hmm. being a nurse was. Yes. I think it feels less of that these days. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, once you were in teaching, was it everything that you had hopes it would be? No, no. So um, all the same sort of things happened again, where I was appalled at certain people's attitudes and Mm -hmm. um and I always used to vow I will never be like that person Mm -hmm. I will never say those things and be like that person so I suppose I have another phrase that I talk to my kids about which was something that I didn't really realize as I was growing up um I thought that that as as people were in really responsible jobs they would Mm -hmm. therefore be really responsible well-fitted people for Mm -hmm. that post yeah and and as I said to somebody the other day there's our souls everywhere it doesn't matter what career you go into (laughs) and that's liberating 
yeah. because it kept it kept the likes of me from a working class background down because you know you think that somebody who, who owns their own business yeah. they must have some particular talent or you know extra money or, or mm -hmm. what they've got something other than you have and yeah. um so I didn't start my business until I was in my 40s and, yeah. and I would never have considered that that was an option for me ever yeah yeah so um yeah there's our souls everywhere <laughs> did you have experiences of being taught well yourself when you were at school and uni and, and yeah. all of that yeah yeah absolutely so um I would say so when I started my business where it was running stage schools I thought well how do you get to be a good leader what hmm. what's that about and I thought back to the head teachers that I had and what did they do yeah. that was different from the god awful ones mm -hmm. predominantly it was um support of teachers you yeah. know in, in not just if they were in trouble or if they, you know, got things going on, but just mm -hmm. encouraging them, making them think they were doing something right. Because I think yeah. we're sort of tuned into telling kids, mm -hmm. oh, well, but we don't yeah. do that with adults half enough, I don't think. No, no. Uh, and so I, I definitely, and, and for you to trust your staff, mm -hmm. that they want good things as well, that they're yeah. not there to be managed and pushed into um groups and practices because you believe in them yeah let them contribute and feel like they're making a difference as well that's yeah. what keeps people with you and I, and I hope I achieved that I believe I did because mm -hmm. staff stayed with us for lots of years so I think yeah. that's maybe the true yeah true so what what was the segue between you being a teacher teaching in schools to reaching a point where you were teaching in probably quite a different way mm -hmm. through the stage schools how did how did you end up flipping from one type of teaching to something quite different well you haven't got long enough to listen to the story but we we hit a <laughs> horrendous personal patch whereby we we'd um, bought a property literally with immaculate timing as the backside fell out of the property market right so that that saga went on for ages and, and our kids were little at that point and then there were um, my husband worked for a local authority and they were laying people off at that time okay and we were just really struggling at, and at rock bottom and um and i i honestly believe that you know I was led to this, mm -hmm. you know, something, something or someone or some higher being or whatever. But I, I always used to buy the Times Educational Supplement. And mm -hmm. this particular day, I saw an advert for Stagecoach. Yeah. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. And it said, um, ring this number for more details. So I thought, okay. oh, well. and it was just curiosity, really, at that point. Yeah. I didn't think I was going to do anything. Um, so I rang them up and they sent me a, a pack and then they made a follow up call mm -hmm. and they said, you sound like just the person, the sort of person we need, you know, your experience is fantastic. And I said, yeah, but I've not done anything with performing arts. I'm not an actress. Mm -hmm. No, but you've done plays at school. You know, you've told me you've done all of this. So I went, oh, oh, <laughs> so it was like them making me think about it yeah and because we'd had such an horrendous time prior to that i always i'd, I'd said to myself repeatedly i'll never take a risk again i'll yeah. never take a money risk again yeah and were um, you still teaching in the school at this point in time as well yeah, yeah. and this by this time were you in primary school i'd got into primary at last primary. yeah i think okay. i was 35 before i got to do Ooh. what i'd <laughs> what you set to out to do. Yeah. and were were you happy Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was. Right. Well, well, I say I was. Yes, I was. I, that was probably the happiest job I'd ever had. Mm -hmm. But the head teacher, who I modelled a lot of what I wanted to be on, yeah, um, was headhunted and went to another school. Okay. And as often happens, everything shifted like the yeah. ground moved beneath yeah. you. 
Yeah. Um, and also Ofsted had just been invented. The national okay. curriculum was just wow. kicking in. Okay. It was like a, a perfect a storm. Big change really. in the times. Yeah. 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 So, but <laughs> what I actually did was I started the business whilst I was still working. So you so, were doing what quite a lot of my NLP for kids practitioners end up doing, which is sort of riding two different waves at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't know which one's going to carry you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on uh, one incredible day. So I started my I opened my first school. It was phenomenally successful. There were people mm. queuing around the block to come oh, to this open wow. day. The, the people from head office just couldn't believe it. They kept saying, just open the fire doors and let them in. I said, no, no, I need to have their address. No, they are <laughs> and so in so. terms of, so for people that have never heard of Stagecoach before, what, it, what gets included if a child signs up, what do they get? They come, it depends on their age. So yep. um, if they're from maybe six through to 18, mm -hmm. they come for an, three hours and they do an hour of dance an hour of drama and an hour of singing okay. and they're in a group of about no more than 17 mm -hmm. so there's a high ratio of staff to kids so that yeah. the staff know their children well mm -hmm. um and yes on the face of it it's about performing arts training but that was never what I felt it was about once yeah. I got started it was all about how kids can work learn to work together as a mm -hmm. team how they can learn to be a leader yeah what makes them feel more confident and act more confident and the byword for stagecoach in a lot of the advertising was how it increases children's confidence and it does immensely um and that became of real interest to me you mm -hmm. know so what do kids do once they feel confident in one area and what I saw was if they're confident in one area, they'll it bleeds sideways and they'll be yeah. confident in other areas too. Yeah. And similarly, if they're non-confident in one key area, that mm -hmm. bleeds sideways and they'll be yeah. non-confident everywhere else as well. Yeah. And that was it, it sounds so basic, such a basic truth now, but yeah. it, it hadn't occurred to me. Yeah. Up to that point. I would imagine it's the source of venture where you can see some very big transitions in the children that attend yeah huge immense so um and uh, again now I think some of the children that I dealt with um were autistic were on the spectrum okay um because and so because stagecoach says that you know stagecoach builds confidence then you get a disproportionate number of parents bringing mm. their children because they have confidence issues yeah yeah so i suppose that was my best training ground because suddenly there was more of, probably what's happening in mainstream school now yeah was happening for me 20 years ago when suddenly we had a lot of kids with a lot of issues yeah so um so the mum my mum in me you've got a problem let me try and solve it yeah was kicking in with those and so I, it taught me an immense amount mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. one of the key things I think and this is definitely NLP based mm. um, so we took four-year-olds and sometimes they were like rising four-year-olds so they could start mm. in the term in which they became four and it never surprised me that they would cry when they were brought because sure. you say to your children don't leave me and don't mm -hmm. talk to strangers yeah. and then you leave them in a venue full of strangers <laughs> so why wouldn't they cry but it started to interest me that they would yeah they'd cry uh, my staff were really brilliant and experienced at jollying them along so by the end they'd have a smile on the face a drink yeah. and a biscuit and a chest full of stickers and mm -hmm. mum would say to them have you had a good time they'd say yes mm -hmm. are you coming again next week yes they'd come again next week and cry yeah now the teacher in me went ah there's a child who's uh, manipulating their parent they know which buttons to press mm -hmm. but because I wasn't having to deal with it as a problem myself because I yeah. wasn't teaching the group yeah I could stand back and observe it more mm -hmm. and what I realized was that the the distress was totally genuine mm -hmm. but it was misplaced 
Mm. And I noticed that very often they'd come and they'd cry in exactly the same position where they'd cried the week before. Right. I thought, this is interesting. So I started to experiment, taking them off their parents in a different part of the college yeah. Yeah. and telling them a joke across the bit where they cried yeah. the week before. Yeah. And just changing the circumstances in which they were coming in. And it yeah. was like magic. Yeah. It was totally like magic. And we would have some terms we would start with maybe... I think we had 11 of these classes for the youngest ones mm -hmm. starting at any one, um, not all at the same time, but across the weekend. And sometimes we would have no criers in all of those 11 classes. Yeah. And that that was really the basis of, of what I do with magical change. Mm -hmm. Because um, one September, uh, a dad came to me and he said, I've come to see you in person because I want you to know that this has got nothing to do with Stagecoach. Right. But my daughter doesn't want to come back. So I said, oh, so what's that about then? He said, well, it, we're having a terrible time. He said, she's... Uh, she's not eating, she she won't go to school, she won't go to friends' houses, she's clinging to her mother all the time. He said, and at its worst, we've had her at A&E with a full-blown panic attack, and the girl was nine. Okay. Now, that's shocking now, mm. but like 10 years ago, yeah. we weren't hearing about this kind of thing. Absolutely thing not, no. So I'm trying to be helpful again, so this is my mum coming, I'm trying yeah, to be helpful, yeah. I'm throwing things in the air, and I said, well, I have this conversation with my little four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. I said, and when they're feeling nervous and worried, I said, it helps them. I said, it probably won't help her at all, but it won't do her any harm because it's mm -hmm. only positivity. He said, we'll try anything, anything. Yeah. We're desperate. So he brings her the next week. And I'd had her for about two years at that point. So I knew her quite well. Yeah. But she was like totally transformed. She was in a really bad place. She couldn't give me eye contact. She was hunched over. And I started to speak to her and I thought, you're not going to listen to what I'm saying to you because you're waiting for me to scoop mm -hmm. you up and drag you off into stagecoach because she was yeah. tense as anything. So I thought, I've got to stop her from doing that. So I said, OK, darling, so you this is what what you need to know, that you can't come to stagecoach this week. And mm -hmm. I think that was the only time she looked at me as if to say, well, this mm -hmm. wasn't what I expected. Yeah. And I said, no, you have to listen to me this week. And if you'd like to come next week, that would be wonderful. But you can't come this week. And I just watched all the tension ease out of her. Mm -hmm. And I carried on talking. And she gave me nothing else that showed me that anything had made any impression or mm -hmm. anything. And as they all left, I thought, that's the last time I'll see that family. It's such a shame. Yeah. yeah. So the next week. Um, I'm in the entrance hall and the dad's there and he stepped out of the way and there she is standing yeah. behind him nice as nine plants looking like she'd ever done before and I went wow and I, then I thought don't fuss her don't don't make a big deal about it because that might make her back off so yeah. I said oh how lovely to see you and then I thought oh I better talk about shoes or something <laughs> um so I kept my eye on her and she came up to me during the morning and she said Trudy I think it's going to be a free stick a week so I said, that's amazing, darling. Well done, you. So she played on my mind and I, I got home. And during the week, I rang them up and I said, um, I'm, I just wonder what you said to her to get her to come this yeah. week. He said, we didn't say anything. I said, what? She decided she was coming herself. He said, yeah. I said, oh, good. He said, actually, she started to stop doing a lot of the things she was doing. I mm. said, what? Stuff not to do with stagecoach? He said, yeah. I said, oh, good. <laughs> mm. So the next Saturday he came and he came up to me and he said, she stopped doing all of it. And even when I tell people that, I looked at him and it was like somebody did me over the head with a mallet. I thought, <laughs> what? I, no, what, what was that all about? And I couldn't function. I, I'm walking around saying to people, what, what is it? Just listen to this. What, what do you think is happening here? And I was really fortunate in that one of the mums was um, an educational psychologist, but I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm telling her this story and she said, oh, that's really interesting, Trudy. She said, I'm an educational psychologist. I said, right, come in here, come in here. I'm going to tell you what I said to her and you tell me what's working. Yeah. So she did. And she said, well, on the face of it, she said, it's fairly straightforward she said but there must be something about it that's appealing to children and mm -hmm. making them think it's doable 
she said you should you should tell the university about it I said and tell them what she said well there might be somebody doing some research and mm -hmm. you know they might be interested and I probably would never have done that except my daughter was doing a psychology degree at Teesside Uni at that time so she put me in touch with somebody and they were really encouraging and they yeah. had me in. And by the time I'd finished, I was doing some kind of a research project in it with awesome. an asking for ethical clearance. I'm not quite <laughs> sure how that happened. Um, so that was the start of it all, really. And then yeah. there was another woman I spoke to on that same day. And this is why I think it's just been like fate. Yeah. So her son, he'd been expelled from school. Um, at the age of six which takes some doing yeah um, and he we had him and yay was lively but he liked what he was doing with us and mm -hmm. we could cope with him so I told her the story and she said oh that's that's fantastic Trudy and I said the shame we don't have a magic card for your boy yeah because to me this was all about anxiety in this girl mm -hmm. and then as soon as the words were out of my mouth I thought well, this would be really interesting. So if it worked for him with a different problem and not a problem he's showing me anyway, mm. that would be really exciting. So I, I explained to her what was involved. She said, yeah, we're happy to try that. So mm -hmm. along he comes. And, and again, why I think he was on the spectrum was he was giving me no eye contact whatsoever, legs swinging yeah. and he's gazing around the ceiling. So I'm talking to him thinking nothing's going in. Um, so we got to the end and I always say to the kids, so are you going to take this, um, this challenge with me? And he said, yeah. I said, that's brilliant. Well done you. Now, on the face of it, it went tits up at that point because right. mum goes home, doesn't tell dad this has even happened. And dad brings him the next week, doesn't know he needs any stickers or to see me. I'm looking for him, he's gone. The following week I had a sickness bug and I wasn't in. So now this child has gone three school weeks with no positive reinforcement in between. In my mind, I think we're starting again. So I'm walking down to the class to pick him out at the end. And his mum's walking down the corridor. So I said, oh, what's he been like this week? And she just stopped dead in the corridor. And she just looked at me and she didn't say anything. And, and I just panicked. I thought, what's she doing? Why is she looking at me? <laughs> so I said, what? She said, I can't describe the difference in him. She said, he's like an entirely different child. And I'm still in negative mode. So I'm going, oh my yeah. God, it's the school down now. Was yeah, yeah. So I said, why, what's he doing? And she, she had a, an older son. She said, tell Trudy what he's been like. And he said, well, he's been a lot better. I said, what, at school? He said, yeah. And I filled up because I thought, yeah. poor little devil, he's done all of that by himself. Yeah. Nobody, nobody to help him, you know? So I go and see him and um, I said, so darling, how many stickers do you think it is this week? He said, it's definitely three, definitely three. So I said, well, that's amazing. I said, why do you think that? He said, because I've been trying all the time. Oh. I said, I know you have. I said, your mum's been telling me wonderful things about you. I said, you know, when I was talking to you last week, I didn't think you were listening to me. And he's still kind of doing this. Yeah, yeah. I said, I didn't think you were listening to me. He went, but I was listening to you. <laughs> and it was like he looked into my soul and I went, oh, shit. <laughs> well, wow. <laughs> so um, that gave me the confidence to go, this is not about anxiety. This is about changing all sorts of behaviours. Yeah. And so whenever I had an opportunity to try it with a different child in a different situation, I did. Yeah. Um, it's been fab. So the magic change system, do you think, did it change form over the years? Have you revised it or has it largely stayed the same as that initial conversation you had with that first little girl you told us about? Well, I would say that probably 80% of it or maybe even more than that is the same. Okay. Um, I did have, I, I did start to worry. <laughs> so um, I, I had quite a lot of success with it. Mm -hmm. And then one, a mum one day came to me and the mums sit in with them on it. Right. But I always say to the mums, I don't want you to sit next to your child because yeah. if you do, they'll keep deferring to yes. you. Yeah. But I want you to sit at the back. And if I never look at you and I never speak yeah. to you, that's good. 
because yeah. that means yeah. we're connected, you know. Yeah. But I do want them to listen to it because I want them to be able to back up things I'm saying and, and yes. say it at the relevant times. So um, this little, her daughter had moved from the younger class to the older class and she'd mm -hmm. had a male teacher for the first time right. and it threw her. So I'd said to her, how does, how does your body tell you that you're feeling anxious or nervous? She said, well, and she was so graphic. <laughs> so, some of the, come out with the most amazing things. She said, mm -hmm. well, it was like a bubble in my stomach. She said, and it just keeps growing and growing. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, well, that must be really uncomfortable. We'll have to see what we can do about that bubble. Mm -hmm. So the next week when she came back, I said, and how are you feeling this week? She said, my bubbles popped. Oh. And her mum just welled up behind her. So um, about six weeks after that, the mum stopped me in the corridor and she said, uh, I've used the magic card with somebody. Mm. I said, oh, have you? Who, who? What under what circumstances? She said, me. Mm. I said, you? She said, yeah. She said, it really moved me when she said that the bubble had popped. She said, and I thought, well, if a bubble can pop in a seven-year-old, I'm damn sure it can pop in, in a whatever age she was, you know. So I said, why? What's the matter? She said, well, I've been bullied at work for about two years. Mm -hmm. She said, and I've gone through all of the things that you do, which is the person will leave, someone will notice, somebody will intervene. She said, and I thought, no, I'm not having it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm panicking by this time. I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> what a nice in motion here. I said, so what have you done? She said, well, I've put in an official complaint and it, it's right. going through the system. And my eyes are going, I thought, oh, hell. We've released hell, the monster. <laughs> so um, I started also to worry about the kids in the sense that I could see it was working in the short term, but mm -hmm. how do you make it work long term? Or yeah. I, I know you can't, but how, how do you increase those chances of it working long term? So I developed um, an add on. So they, the, the precept of what they do with the stickers is I don't, yes, they get the stickers from me, but I don't give them the stickers. They tell me and they justify to me what they need. Mm -hmm. And I always say to them, I'll never take your stickers away from you. Mm -hmm. So if you tell me it's three stickers, because I thought, you know, little kids, they'll go, oh, it's three every week because they like stickers so much. Yeah. Absolutely not. The exact reverse of that is true. So, so they, they underestimate. They're modest about it. Um, I think some of it's modesty. I think some of it is they don't have a... A proper sense of okay. how far yeah. they've come I think it's oh, a genuine really? thing really? yeah yeah um so so they put these stickers in the sticker card and again <laughs> this was sent so this sticker card I give them has imagery on it which is absolutely perfect for talking to them about what people look like when they're feeling anxious mm -hmm. what happens when they do something different what they'll be like when it's all over so it's got all sorts of visual imagery in okay. and it's it's something i bought commercially it's not anything i've invented for myself so it, yeah. that was a gift so when they finished that the, the first child i said this to the words were out of my mouth and i thought oh you shouldn't have said that <laughs> so I said, and when this sticker card is full of stickers, your problem will have gone away. Would have said, maybe, perhaps. <laughs> Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> no, I actually think that's part and parcel of it now. 100%. And I tell them all that. Yeah. I yeah. say that all the time. Um, it's so interesting you say about that because it's the thing when I am teaching NLP, the thing that I flag up most with the trainees is when they say things like, um, we're gonna try an exercise and hopefully it's gonna give you the result that you might like to have. <laughs> I jump in and go, yeah. no, we are doing this and it will give you the result that you want. Exactly. And it's, exactly. you know, people find it very, very challenging to um, deliver that level of certainty yeah. quite often but it yeah. makes such a big difference to the person that's listening. Yeah, you know? it absolutely does. But so much of this has happened to me by accident. Yeah. <laughs> so as, as you're picking yeah. up, you know, it's, yeah. it's not coming. I, I suppose, yes, it's by accident, but mm. 
the experience I've had with kids and the experience yeah. of knowing what pleases them and what mm -hmm. um, alienates them, mm -hmm. that, that must be the background to it. So, you know, yeah. I don't think you can negate the experience, but definitely confidence wise, um, I wasn't coming from a knowledgeable place, which is how yeah. I came. I don't think I've ever told you how I came to be NLP trained by you. No. Today. My dad was really poorly at the time and he was living with us and um, the business was, you know, all consuming. So I was really over overly worked, shall we say. And you were just doing stagecoach by that, that time. So you'd left the teaching in school. Yeah, yeah. yeah I had. Um, so what had happened was, as I say, he was poorly and um, my my daughter's husband, I had invested some money so that he could do um, uh, a franchise business. So okay. Stagecoach was a franchise business. Yeah. And and I wanted something that he could do on the side, a bit like the way I'd started yeah. until he could see if he could get it going. Hmm. So as a result of that, I got an email. I don't know whether it came once a week or once a month from this organization. Mm. I never opened them. I never opened one of them. I just deleted them. This particular day, for whatever reason, I opened the email and it had like a box with four adverts in it. And one of them was yours, mm -hmm. NLP for kids. Yeah. And I went, NLP? I think that's got something to do with counselling. I was actually confusing it with CBT at that uh, point. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, and I thought oh, that might be interesting. So I go to your website mm -hmm. and you were doing one of your days in London. Yeah. Now, I'm seldom in London, even mm -hmm. more seldom now, but then I, I was never there. But it just so happened that day fell when I was going to go down. And the yeah. reason I was going to go down was one of my students, one of my original students was living in London and had had um, a breakdown and had been... Um, put into a mental hospital in London and I was going to go and see her yeah so I thought well while I'm there I'll do something useful and I'll go and find out what this is all about so I went to see um, my student it was quite horrendous I was there for about two and a half hours there was alarms going off all the time which meant wow. I wouldn't go on to the ward to see her yeah when I went to see her she was just you know, completely out of it, talking yeah. total rubbish. It, it, it was quite uh, distressing. Yeah. So I come to you the day after and you did the, um, an art, uh, an exercise, which was the three chair business. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I was there with nobody I knew and this poor woman, the time she's next to us, <laughs> thought she'd drawn the short straw. So I'm chatting to her and then you, you explain what it was and I thought, that's fantastic my further stages students in drama will love that yeah so I'm, I'm really really excited about it so you went round and you said it was going to be a and b and I was going to be the one doing it and I was still fine with all of that so I sat on the chair the first chair where I was talking about what I wanted to do and what mm -hmm. I wanted to achieve I was yeah. fine I stood up I went to the second chair as soon as my backside touched the chair. So this is the one where this is somebody who believes you can do it. Yeah. And I started to cry and I had no idea why I was crying. And this woman's looking at me and I thought, oh, I'll have to go in the loo. So I rushed off to the loo. I wash, washed my face. I think you were looking at me from the back one. <laughs> so I thought, oh, all right, I'm OK now. So I got to the door, started crying again. I had to go back in. By the time I came out, it was totally finished. Yeah. And I thought, oh. Oh, what's the matter with me and so I put it down that I'd been upset the day before and yeah. it had something to do with that I didn't know um and then I came to see you at the end and what I really liked about the conversation I had with you was you said to me you you mustn't do this now you're not to do it now <laughs> now I thought if that if that woman is out for the books then she wouldn't be telling me that no. so I, you really rose in my estimation there um and so I subsequently did the training with you after my dad died yeah and I came maybe the February I think after that yeah yeah I think it was it, it was close to a year later it was it was yeah. a significant period of time I remember yeah yeah but uh yes you you had my respect Gemma 
Thank you for that. very much. So you did the NLP for kids training and by that point, what you weren't doing stagecoach then? Yes, I was. Yeah, you I were did. still doing it. What yeah. was happening? Because I, I remember, I actually remember it from when you were with me in London at that event that you've just mentioned. It sounded like things had changed with stagecoach. Yeah, it, it what, they, they weren't queuing up around the block anymore. That's right. So after 2008, when the, the big slump happened, mm -hmm. uh, it didn't surprise me. But, you know, parents had better things to spend the money on than sending yeah. their kids to stagecoach. So it became an uphill struggle from 2008. And, was that um, it was it a quick change or was it over time it started slowing down? It was a bit of both. So um, I'd always had a £10,000 overdraft facility mm -hmm. that took me from one term to the next because yeah. cash flow sure. happened, the, the money came in three times a year. Yeah. Um, literally, in the September of 1997, I had a, a letter from the bank saying, uh, you can no longer have this facility. Right. At the same time, both of my venues, who had previously invoiced me in arrears, Mm -hmm. said they wanted invoicing up front right so I was faced with having to pay back rent yeah forward rent and yeah. no ten thousand pound yeah so really that that was the the black hole that everything mm -hmm. I, I was just sort of juggling after that yeah. trying to rob peter to pay paul and the fact yeah. that i kept going for as many years as i did mm. i'm quite proud about to be quite honest yeah yeah um but all of that must have taken a toll on me because, um, you know, towards the end. So all of the people who founded the business, uh, they retired or they moved and okay. new people came in and it became. It became different. It felt different to a, to a lot of people, but particularly to me, what I'd liked about the um, early days was that you felt that the people were interested in people yeah you as well yeah. you know at their own franchisees and yeah and that it wasn't business related yeah and then because it moved on it didn't feel to me like that anymore mm -hmm. but that it still wasn't a reason for me to leave I'm sure. by then I knew what I was doing and I could cope really without a lot of input from head office at that yeah. point yeah. And you'd had success, not just from a business building financial perspective, but from a, a credibility side as well, right? Yeah. yeah. So we became the byword around here for what was good in performing arts training. Um, we had Jamie Bell was our student who was in Billy Elliot. We had yeah. uh, a good handful of kids who performed in the West End. Mm -hmm. um, we had so we had success in the performing arts field, which is what it's supposed to be yeah. all about. Yeah. But what interested me just as much, if not more, was the successes we had with kids on personal levels. And and that's what appalls me really now is how little I knew and how many thousands of autistic kids I must have taught in my time and never known and never had any strategies to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still the case. I, you know, I think there are Definitely. special teachers who know about it, but mainstream classroom teachers don't. Yeah, it's, it's funny you say about that because I remember going from obviously nursery nursing so my background was working with children to then NLP for kids and it feels like it was maybe around 2009 something like that where I kind of finally went so hang on what is this spectrum stuff what do I what do I need to know about this yeah which is crazy <laughs> It's you know, the number of children that I must have come into contact with already exactly. where it would have just passed me by. And now I can maybe talk to a child for five or 10 minutes and go, ah, oh, there's something there. That's me as well. Yeah. yeah. You, you develop a radar, don't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
And I, I think it's so sad and, and so sad that they get so misunderstood and that they get labeled early on. Um, it's horrendous. So the confidence thing, I mean, I'm thinking about a, a boy that I had when I was a mainstream teacher. And this was something I'd read about in the Times Ed. It was a lovely idea. And you, you chose a child, they went outside the room mm -hmm. and all the rest of the kids in the class could only say positive things about them. Right. And then you brought them in and you told them all the positive mm -hmm. things that had been said about them. And then you wrote it down and yeah. gave them a certificate that, mm -hmm. that said that. And I thought, oh, that's lovely. So the kids were very excited about it. And um, this boy had come to our school from another school with a really bad reputation for horrendous behavior and all sorts. Um, so this was about week three of his first term and his name came out of the hat. And I was just about to say, we don't know you well enough yet, darling. So can we wait a little bit later and we'll do it before Christmas, but we'll all know you better then. But as I looked up, his face was so excited. I, oh. I didn't have the heart to say yeah. no. So outside the room he went and the kids didn't know a lot about him. And what they did know about him, they weren't keen on because yeah. he was obviously starting to show some of the traits from the previous play. So it was hard, but we pulled it together and we brought him in and he was just wreathed and smiles and he took his certificate home. Now that was the start of year three. Yeah. On the last day of year six, I'm leaving to go home in the summer, for the summer holidays and his mum's coming into school and um, she said, oh, I've just come to thank you. And I thought she'd mistaken me for his class teacher. And I'm going, no, Mrs. So-and-so's room's up yeah, there. Yeah. And she said, no, I've come to thank you. I said, what for? She said, um, he still got that certificate that you gave him in year three. She said, it's still on his bedroom wall. She said, and that was the first time he realised anybody liked him. Oh, God love him. Now, at that point, as I'm driving home, I thought, he never did develop into that kid we were warned about from the mm. other school. Yeah, he had his moments, but yeah. he wasn't that monster that we were described. So, yeah, yeah. you know, all of these things just teach you such basic stuff and you just wish you knew it when you were younger and it yeah. was some use to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, of the experiences that you've ended up having, which bits are you most proud of now? Um, what do you mean out of everything that's happened in in my life? Yeah. Uh, definitely the magic change mm -hmm. part of it, because I can see I can see it's made huge differences to a lot of kids mm -hmm. and lasting differences. So I'm very proud of that I, I, because people and particularly the parents are so desperate. They don't know what to do and yeah. they, they convince themselves they're doing the wrong thing. And, you know, they're not. They're just doing the best they can with what yeah. they've got, like we all are. Yeah. Um, for that and, and definitely my stagecoach days I, I think I made a lot of difference to kids um sense of themselves and sense mm. of their, their capabilities and our oldest ones always used to say they felt safe when they came to us That's and lovely. that they you know lots of them ended up being head boys head girls prefects yeah. all of that shows that it's life transferable skills so yeah definitely. yeah I'm proud of that definitely what was it like reaching that point of saying goodbye to stagecoach because it was a significant period of your life and I'm sure lots of significant experiences from being there that can't have been that must have been like a I don't know like a divorce or a significant you know relationship breakup what was it like um it was mixed so it's it's interesting this because I was talking to somebody about this very thing last night um I had this dream so I remember talking to somebody at a conference uh, it would be a, a stagecoach conference saying uh basically how she hoped that when she left people would be distraught mm. and I was horrified I thought you know what is the point of that yeah yes you've had a role in it but it's got a life of its own yeah yeah you know it's it's standing by itself why do you want to mm. rock that boat so I, I developed this 
dream for myself that um, on the last day I would walk, I'm getting off. <laughs> I would walk through the classrooms, I'd see it was all running as it ever had, and I'd go home and nobody would know I'd gone. Mm -hmm. And that didn't happen. <laughs> no. So um, I became I became ill um, and it sort of crept up on me. I didn't know what it was and nobody could tell me what it was. So I started to get um, joint problems um from like the previous summer so I felt like I'd lifted something or I'd twisted something and I couldn't mm -hmm. walk properly on that so I started limping and then the limp made the other leg bad and I was I was just getting worse and worse walking um and then um I, I can't remember how it escalated now but I ended up in bed for five weeks in total agony everywhere <laughs> and I was convinced I was dying I, thought, oh, I was dying of cancer um, and nobody's been able to tell me what that was so the nearest thing they've said is um, that it's probably fibromyalgia because I've been scanned and you know I've had everything uh, but I can't find anything so I suppose I could have been down about that but I was so glad I was still breathing I think so it's a bit like that light bulb moment where you go well I am still breathing so people say to me now are you all right and I say yeah I'm breathing and it's always a good thing and <laughs> so so I, I can get around, I can't walk great distances and I'll get tired very easily and you know everything that goes with that. But I knew I couldn't carry on doing that because I, I would walk miles on a weekend, I'd be in and out of classrooms, down corridors. So I didn't want to be anything I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, I didn't want to fade away as it were. Yeah. Um, so I tried to sell the business for about two years. And really I think I was, um, <laughs> it was spoiled by the fact it had been such a success because I had so mm. many schools, people would need a lot of money to be able to buy it. So they couldn't yeah. just come in at, on the ground level. Anyway, I couldn't find a buyer and because I was so bad, I handed it back to the franchisor. Right. Um, and then I had to go, so what am I going to do now? So <laughs> what career am I going to take on now? Yeah. And I wanted desperately to do something more with the magical change. And I'd always, whilst I've been at Stagecoach, although I was being an administrator predominantly, I had done bits of teaching. So I did exam work mm -hmm. and I liked it and I and we did well. So um, I thought, well, I can do that. And, and now that's been a fabulous, <laughs> it's been a fabulous third career. So mm -hmm. even during lockdown, it, it actually expanded during lockdown. So I'm now international, Gemma, mm -hmm. are, you, are you impressed? Very. <laughs> So I teach in Australia, Sri Lanka, the Netherlands, and shortly awesome. in Canada as well. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> so that's that's been lovely because that's me connecting as a teacher, like I originally wanted to be, one on one. Lovely. And are you teaching English or? No, I teach. Um, it's speech and drama, but it's okay. predominantly how you know it's public speaking. It's yeah. it's how to. To pronounce your words properly and to okay. be able to change your voice if you need to yeah it's about that really fabulous love it and do you get much call to do the magical change work with those young people yeah <laughs> yes that yeah. they've kind of appeared as a result of it yeah yeah um so it's funnier though again because uh, one parent contacted me and she said oh I, I thought just because you were a teacher you might know somebody who counsels children <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I do. uh so yeah it's and i i don't advertise um the magical change aspect of it because mm -hmm. it's so it's so time consuming and i'm doing the other stuff it yeah you know it, it's not it's not a career for me it's a, yeah. it's like a research project for sure. me still yep um but it, it where i think it could really help is you know pe teachers in primary schools mm -hmm. and infant schools nursery schools get yeah. them while they're young get them yeah. while you can make a difference yeah um 
TAs, the one, you know, the TAs who are dealing with children with difficulties, I think it would could really help them. Yeah. So part of what I did, I started to work with this little girl whose dad was a, a head teacher and mum was a, teacher, a primary teacher as well. Um, and she'd woken up in the middle of the night with a fire alarm going off and it was right. a fault on the system, but yeah. it had obviously shook her to the core. Yeah. And so then this anxiety about fire alarms going off extended to school, mm -hmm. the supermarket, everywhere else. And then because it had happened at night, with everything to do with the nighttime mm -hmm. procedure. And so she was in a, a bad way, really. She was a superstar. Within about three weeks, she'd stopped doing what she was doing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, this is a good opportunity with the dad because he's seen it happen with his own daughter. Yes. He let me go into his school and yeah. work with children who don't know me because mm -hmm. part of my part of why I came to you was I want to know what it is. What is this magic thing yeah. happening? And is it some one thing I'm saying? And if I forget to say that, is it not going to work for that kid? Yeah. You know, I, I just <laughs> couldn't get my head around that. Um so he was very kind and he let me go into the school and he gave me, um, as he said, what do you want to work with? So I said, I'd like about half a dozen, lots of different problems, different ages. Yeah. And of those seven I ended up working with, I think four of them were on the autistic spectrum and undiagnosed. Right. And in fact, the one that I wasn't supposed to work with, I think because he thought he was the worst character that mm -hmm. you know, and, and I wouldn't be able to do anything with him. Yeah. I think he is for, for certain. Yeah. And yet, this is the scary thing. He's been referred for an artistic assessment twice and been back healed. Really? I think the the methods or the, the facilities that there are for kids on the spectrum are just totally not fit for purpose no. and, and a frightening really yeah so where do you want the magical change to take you or where would you like it to land like what is there a goal um I'd like to be able to see other people get the same results that I've got. And I know they can yep. because I also did a pilot with some principles of Stagecoach. Mm -hmm. So I asked for people I'd never met. So again, I didn't want anybody I had a connection with just to yep. see whether it could work in its entirety. And I went down and I trained them. Um, we hired a venue in London and I trained them for a morning. And all of them who mm. tried it, had success and some of them were ev were evangelical about it so um, it made it made a big difference to think that and I was frustrated because I thought it could have been huge for stagecoach as well yeah, yeah. be able to say we have something which can quickly yeah. be dialed in a totally positive and therapeutic way yeah but they weren't interested so it didn't go in that direction did um, they end up if this the schools that you had in the area where you were, do they still run now? Is Stagecoach still there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I've actually trained people. I've trained okay. the owners. So yeah. she asked me, she said yeah. parents had talked about it and she mm -hmm. said, I want you to train us to do that. That's so, lovely. So that was nice. Yeah. It was yeah. What's your feelings now? So I just, I kind of wonder how I would feel if, I'd left NLP for kids and then I bumped into it on the street somewhere <laughs> or I, you know, I saw someone driving by and they had the logo on their car. I, I sort of wonder what that nostalgia would feel like. I don't know how you're, you're that... a lot younger than me, Gemma. I mean, look, realistically, <laughs> I, I can't have that many years left. So it's about leaving a legacy behind, yeah. isn't it? Something yeah. that you were part of that other people can, can yes. continue. It, it wouldn't have, I wouldn't care about that at all. Mm. It wouldn't bother me. Yeah. I mean, from a practical level, the fact that I am still working and I'm still teaching face-to-face. -face, so on a Sundays yeah. I teach face-to-face -face and I'm on my feet all the time. I'm up and down, mm -hmm. up and down. 
Now, at the moment, that's all right. But yeah. all it's going to take is for me to have another dip again. Mm-hmm. And, and then that's taken away. So I'm also conscious that if I'm training other people with an online course, yeah. that could be happening when I'm actually not needing to be there. And that's yeah. sort of the... It's a bit more practical. on the cake, yeah. Yeah, is. yeah. And do you know now what you can do to keep yourself well? Uh, have you got to a place where you've maybe identified some triggers or things that you need to do or things you need to avoid? Um, it's not foolproof. Yeah. Um, so I can't predict when some when it might happen. Okay. But I do try and pace myself. So if I have a busy day, I try not to have a busy day the day after so that yeah. you're not because that I was a workaholic, I have to say. Okay. And I, I pushed myself and did all sorts of things which really were were daft with mm. hindsight. So I try not to do that now and I try and factor in more breaks than I had before. Do um, you think you could have achieved the same level of success that you did? had you have taken it a bit easier in the past? Uh, I don't know. I think it's born in you, isn't it? I Mm -hmm. I think your work ethic, some of it's born in you and some of it's what you see. And my mum worked like daft hours and my dad did as Mm. well. Mm. So, you know, to be a hard worker was something that was held up to you as being something to aspire to so I think once it's intrinsic within you you kind of can't kick it out I I find it difficult well there's there's ups and downs so one of the ups is if I've got a day off I'm thinking throughout the day oh I've got a day off (laughs) (laughs) so I enjoy it multiple times when I remind (laughs) myself I've got one Um, but on the downside um I don't know I think I think if I wasn't working and if I wasn't doing anything I think I would possibly be less healthy than Mm -hmm. I am now because it's giving my mind something to do if all I had to do was sit and think about my woes and about which bits hurt Mm -hmm. me yeah I I don't think that's a good place to be so no I think I'm do you think you'll ever retire that's a good question (laughs) I do have this hobby that I really love. I love doing um, paper craft. So okay. I like make cards and scrapbooks and stuff like that. And I can yeah. lose myself in that. Um, so I'd like to be able to do more of that. Mm-hmm. But no, I don't, I don't think I'd like to be out of it completely. Mm. I'd always like to feel like I've got something to contribute somewhere. Yeah. What does that do for you? That knowing that you're contributing... What does that do for you on an emotional level? Um, I think it gives you a reason to be alive, really. Mm -hmm. Um, If you can see things happening around you that you know you you haven't done by yourself, but that you've had an appreciable input into, I think that makes a big difference. So, yeah, it's lovely to be part of something like that and to see what a difference that makes, not only to that person, but to their family. 100%. Yeah, the, the ripple effect just keeps on going yeah. doesn't it yeah, yeah. Y- you talk about confidence a lot do you think has your confidence remained steady throughout your life as there been peaks and troughs it's a funny thing <laughs> It, it, because I was noticing while I was talking to you that I was talking as if I wasn't confident in things mm-hmm. and, and that is true so I was telling you what was my perception at that time and yet I think I come across as being confident to a lot of people definitely so I think they'd be surprised about that but yeah. then again I think that's true of everybody true to some extent also yeah. you are from a performing arts background to some extent yeah. so <laughs> yeah you can turn on the yeah <laughs> yeah I, I think um I, I think people who are overconfident are often underconfident underneath and yes yeah they're um, overcompensating in a way yeah yeah, yeah. and it, it, I don't think it's a good thing to be totally confident all the time because it means you've got very fixed ideas about where the truth lies. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it means that you might miss important stuff. You know, mm. if if you're too sure, 
you might not be kind of looking both ways when you cross the road if you're absolutely certain there's no traffic there kind of a thing exactly yeah exactly yeah it's uh but confidence is something that i think private schools build mm. and i think mainstream schools don't why do you think that is what's the difference in what they're doing there i think some of it might be taught sort of actively taught mm. um some of it is because they're surrounded by people who are of a similar background to themselves mm -hmm. and a, a similar, um, you know, monetary status as themselves. Yeah. But I think in primary schools, it, it's the system. The mm -hmm. system wants to produce equal length, same tasting sausages to spit yeah, out yeah. at the other end. Mm -hmm. And anything that doesn't want to go into that sausage skin Yep. is a problem yeah and that isn't where it needs to be coming from at all no so you just made me think of something there was a long long time ago when i was first setting up superheroes our non-profit company i went to a course about bid writing and there was a phrase that was used there and i hear it all the time now particularly from politicians but i've used it a lot when i've written bids myself and it's about leveling the playing field so that everybody has the you know the same chance and maybe in a way private school doesn't level the playing field it says if you can do better then like keep like keep running keep going do, do the best that you can do whereas maybe what we're saying there with state schools is it is level everybody out yeah yeah i think i think you yeah you probably hit the nail on the head there i think it's it's more okay to be individual mm -hmm. in a private school because they've got better staffing yes and that they, they, they can cope you know yeah. you can cope with an individual if you've only got 15 in your class yeah but if you've got four individuals in a class of 35 then that yeah it gets a bit so more tricky yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that there's a lot of times when there might be a young person who's actually quite talented, but it because they're bored or not stimulated? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it shows yeah, up yeah. in a less Very helpful often. way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think all of, you know, the dyslexic kids mm -hmm. will often fall into that category because so much of normal education is about reading and writing and that's just yeah. their weakness. Yes. So, um, you know, schools are now cutting out performing arts out of the curriculum. So things yeah. that they could shine in that they didn't need to read and write in are being taken away from them. And yeah. all the emphasis is on what you can put on paper. Yeah. Uh, so my own granddaughter's dyslexic and she's okay. very turned off from school and you know it, it's, she doesn't feel there's anything there that's of interest mm -hmm. to her and can't wait to leave I think yeah yeah and which is a shame sad. yeah it's it, very it's sad hugely sad yeah. but I, I even say to kids you know obviously when you're that age school is the world yeah and I, I just say it won't last forever and yeah. that's when you're going to come into your own yeah because you'll be thinking outside the box and mm -hmm. you'll not be doing what everybody else is doing and that will be valued in the workplace and then you're going to come into your own yeah absolutely um, but I, I find it so sad that schools can't do better on mm -hmm. that front at all yeah and I, I feel sorry yeah. it's not the people inside it I feel sorry for for the mm -hmm. teachers because as you know the vast majority of people I've worked with in my teaching career have been really good human beings who've yeah. wanted the best for their kids yeah it's the system that's yes. shit and yeah. while ever um while ever politicians are dabbling in it and trying mm -hmm. to make their own reputations on the back of it then yeah. it's never going to be anything different no um when they first brought in the Ofsted inspections it was it was heartbreaking to watch mm -hmm. different teachers break at different times yeah so some of them went into a flap the minute it was first mentioned others it was the workload while everybody was piling this that and the other on them some of them went after the event like yeah. they held it together for us yeah you no know, and and that's how is that right that people are, are being made to feel as responsible as that 
Mm. So, so one of the things I was telling you, one of my horrendous days was the day I opened Stagecoach was a Sunday. Um, so I worked all day from, I think I was there at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, I finished at about six. I went straight to school to finish off my wall charts and all my oh, stuff right. in my classroom because it was Ofsted day one. Mm. Um, I came home. I was still working on stuff that I had to present to the Ofsted inspector. And then I think I had about three hours sleep and I walked into day one of, a, of an Ofsted inspection. And, and nobody knew what one was at that point. I mean, yeah. they told you about two years in advance you were getting one. It was like being told you were going to have all your teeth pulled out on yeah. day such and such. You didn't <laughs> know what was going on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that all, all of that was was awful times and mm. and it's the the system stinks with it mm. for certain what's next well what I want to do um is I want to take a course that tells me how to deliver courses and what yeah. it, it's all the technology behind it and you know the social media and all of that stuff I can't get my head around at present mm. so I, I need to do that and then I want to get an online course up and running mm -hmm. and, and be able to support people who do the course so yes. I don't want to just like sell them something and then let mm -hmm. them wander off I yeah. want them to be able to feel supported while they try it because it is scary you, you know yeah. you know we live in a risk averse society now nobody wants to do anything they might get sued for no. there, there is nothing scary about what you're saying to the children it is only supportive yeah and I think I've said this to you before, but I remember the last day of one of the, your courses where you had us, you, you'd put big things around the room for us to write on and you, you gave us all these terrible problems that children might be suffering from and yeah. which NLP things might work for yeah. that. And you left us for ages doing it. Yeah. And I thought, there's, there's a rabbit off here. There's, there's, <laughs> you've got to tell us. You're going to tell us there's something different about that. People were really taking it seriously and writing it down. And I thought she's going to say that any of those methods will work for any of those things. Yeah. But you didn't say that. <laughs> you said it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. Anything is going to make a difference because it's about the relationship you have. And, and yeah. if that's what magic changes taught me yeah across 10 years it's not about anything you say in that moment or don't say yeah it's about building that relationship with that child to get them to trust that you know what you're talking about yes. and give them the courage to be able to solve their own problems so yeah. I'm a bit of a slow learner but I got there after 10 years <laughs> <laughs> well, when, I was on, when I was on the first course with you I was on the train going home and I texted my daughter. I said, do you want the good news or the bad news? She said, uh, I'll have the good news. I said, I've invented NLP. <laughs> she said, what's the bad news? I said, I was 40 years too late. <laughs> I realized going home, how many strands of what I'm doing are NLP related. Yeah. So I'm so glad I did your NLP course and not a CBT course, which is what I thought I was going on. <laughs> That's such a good story. <laughs> so if people uh, maybe wanted to engage with the magic change stuff mm -hmm. or get on a, I don't know, pre-order for when the course is uh, available online, what is the best way for people to find out more about it and more about what you're doing there? How can um, I, I have a you? website which yep. is magicalchange.co.uk mm -hmm. um, so I'll I'll put up a new page this week mm -hmm. um, where people can contact me about it and if they're interested in being on a mailing list for yeah. such time as we're ready to go then yeah yeah that's what we'll do marvelous and if someone had a child that they think would benefit from some help with this have you got capacity to take on clients? I have limited capacity okay. at the moment. So um, like I said, the speech and drama work I'm doing mm -hmm. has suddenly, well, it's not suddenly blossomed, but I'm, I'm up to 72 students that I'm trying to get through an exam in December now. Right. Um, so 
you know, I might be able to deal with one or two, but literally mm -hmm. it would be that. Yeah. Um, so, so if people had children in that situation, you know, I may be happy to have a talk to the parent mm -hmm. and then perhaps keep the details for if we do yeah. train people and they've got yes. somebody in their area. Yeah. It, it is interesting and in I did wonder whether this Zoom situation would mm -hmm. be um, an impediment to being able to do it. But the boy I've told you about who's made that huge progress, I hadn't met him in person right. until um, or about three months ago. Okay. For the first time. And that was just to say hello and, you know, meet him kind of thing. So everything I've done with him has been online and I've okay. had other kids totally online as well. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so that really opens the world up, doesn't it? Well, hopefully not for me, but yes, yes. For, somebody else. <laughs> for all of the other people that will benefit from your it. teachings. Yeah. yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. That's so good. Trudy, how have you found the experience of speaking with me today? It's been a joy, Gemma, an absolute joy. <laughs> it's, it's just been like a big chat. And apart from having panda eyes and disgracing <laughs> myself all over the place. Well, I really, really appreciate everything that you've shared with us today. It's been a fascinating conversation. And I think that, you know, it sounds like you've had several lifetimes in a lifetime, if you know what I mean. That's it, very funny you should say that because I often say to people, my life has not seemed like a life. It seemed like a lot of little lives. Yeah, little <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so I'm excited to see what the next life yes. <laughs> with your magical change stuff, you know, where that yeah. one takes you and what that yeah. looks like. I think it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. You're very, very welcome. And there we have it. Did you all love, love, love Trudy as much as I did? Um, I think that there's just some really good lessons in hindsight um, that Trudy shares with us throughout that podcast. I just think there's some really good lessons, like really good life lessons that were shared in this one overall. Um, so, uh, yeah, I love her leadership style. I really like the way that she engages and... Uh, brings people to a place of wanting to and believing that they can do better. You know, she's a super inspiring person, whether she's working with children and young people or even if, you know, she's uh, working with colleagues and other teachers that are around her. And I say this because, you know, by now, um, Trudy actually went through NLP for Kids training. NLP is one of my companies um, where we work with children and young people teaching them how to use NLP strategies to help them around their mental health and well-being um, and it's something that we do on a one-to-one -one basis and going into schools. Shameless plug for NLP for kids. If you'd like to learn more about it, I'll put some information in the description box with this podcast. Um, so Trudy's spin-off from that, something that she already had in the works in fairness, was the magic card um, strategy. So she is now at a point where this is something that she wants other people to learn and uh, develop and gather their own um, uh, experiences and evidence of this thing actually working in a tangible way. So please do reach out to her if you're interested in coaching, mentoring or supporting young people um, and you like the sound of what she's talked about in this podcast, please do go check out her magic card method um, and the details about that are also in the description box for this podcast as well. And that, my friends, is pretty much everything for this week if you have enjoyed this particular podcast make sure that you go and give it a five star review on the podcasting channel that you are listening um if you are listening in on youtube this week then please give it a thumbs up subscribe to the show wherever you are so that you get notified the next time i upload one of these podcasts the next one i have coming up for you is a super interesting one um and yeah i don't think I think I was going to share that one this time, but I got a little bit too excited by Trudy's one. 
so I shared that one instead. Um, but anyway, uh, if you enjoyed the show, make sure you go ahead and click the notifications bell if you are on YouTube listening in so that you get notified the next time one of these videos gets uploaded. But for now, thank you all so much for watching and listening. Leave your comments. Let me know what did you think about the interview with Trudy. We love her. All right. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all on the next one. Take care, everyone. Bye. The People Building podcast was produced and edited by Gemma Bailey. You can find out more information about our products and services on peoplebuilding.co.uk where you can also join in the conversation around specific episodes. The information, opinions and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. It should not be considered professional advice. Unless specifically stated otherwise, we do not endorse, approve, recommend or certify any information product process service or organization that is presented within the podcast and information from this podcast should not be referenced in any way to imply such approval or endorsement.